it amen what it was i loved reading i could spend hours in the library all by myself I would come home with books on a wide range of topics just because I enjoyed the process of reading. One of the things that I developed an early passion about is biographies, learning about the lives of others. I still have that very passion today. One of the biographies that I stumbled on as an elementary school student and again as a middle school student and encountered again both in high school and college and I still am fascinated by the life of George Washington Carver. Uh, George Washington Carver, a solid Christian, uh, was born, you all know, to Black slave parents. Uh, Carver is the brilliant scientist who discovered over 300 uses for the peanut. Truth be told, the most exciting one for me is that it also goes in a payday candy bar, but don't judge me, amen. Uh, from the peanut plant, he developed nearly 300 different products, ink, ice cream, bread, cosmetics, dyes, candy, soap, sausage, and oils. Uh, through the peanut, he found substitutes for flour, cheese, and yes, even coffee. But above all, the greatest find of this brilliant man was to discover the greatest food, some people would argue, that was ever planted or invented. That's probably Cameron Redding talking about that peanut butter. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I knew it. Not only did he, Mr. Carver, aid mankind, but better than that, if you know anything about his life, you know that he gave all of the glory to God. What you don't know, many of us don't know, is that George Washington Carver, for all that he accomplished, was an humble man. He walked in humility, one of the greatest scientists ever known, and yet for him, it was constantly an opportunity to point to God and to give God glory. Here's how he described his own amazing accomplishments. I love this. He said this, quote, when I was young, I said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. But God answered, that knowledge is reserved for me alone. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of the peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. <laughs> ah, and he told me, George was an humble man. The Bible is clear, amen, to be truly great, you and I must be humble, amen. The world says we need to be self-sufficient, self-assured, that we ought to get while we can get it, that we ought to make sure that we are number one, that we ought to make sure that we're always on top and only look out for number one. But scripture says something a little bit different. In our life and in this time, I was listening to ESPN one morning and I heard a discussion that included Stephen A. Smith, who's one of my favorite commentators, talking about who was the greatest. They were were talking about athletes and they were debating uh, whether or not Tom Brady, uh, Michael Jordan, or some other athlete was the greatest. I asked him, well, how can you decide the greatest of all time from across sports? Uh, uh, those are comparing a lot of times apples to oranges. Uh, certainly, if we um, look at national football, if we look at professional football, as much as I don't want to, I may be reluctant. Some of you, especially the Dallas Cowboys, fans may be reluctant to say that Tom Brady right now is in fact the GOAT. Others of us who are NBA fans, we might have a long and hard debate. Some hurt feelings might actually start to flow when we start debating Michael versus, versus LeBron. For those of us who love professional tennis, many of us, amen, are still struggling with what we're seeing 
in this season in Serena Williams because we consider her uh, the greatest of all time. Some of us have concluded uh, that while we can't tumble, we're not flipping anywhere except out of a chair. Simone Biles is in fact the greatest of all time when it comes to gymnastics. Uh, athletes have, we have this debate all the time as athletes continue to set and break records. Uh, we talk about the greatest business person of all time. For the longest, it was Jack Welch. He was the epitome uh, of what it meant to know how to run an American business and succeed. Some would say that Lee Iacocca even predates him. Uh, others would say that no, it's Oprah Winfrey. Uh, she is the greatest businesswoman of all time. Uh, laborers, uh, uh, those of us who work and labor in various jobs, we desire higher pay. As students, we want better grades. Uh, as individuals, yes, even in the church, we want more influence. Uh, and all of us want the coolest friends. Amen. Uh, but there is a danger sometimes in our pursuit for greatness, in our desire to be the best, to be number one, to land on top. One writer suggested that the higher up we find ourselves in terms of power and influence and wealth, the more vulnerable we are to pride and the more prone we are to be blind to our spiritual needs and deficiencies. This pastor would argue that not only are we prone to spiritual blindness and pride when we have money and when we have power and when we have position, we are also prone uh, to the same kind of pride as we grow spiritually. As we grow spiritually, uh, we suddenly uh, start to believe that we are better than other people. Uh, sometimes, uh, as we grow spiritually, uh, we turn to be tend to be more critical of others. Uh, uh, let me say it differently: we tend to judge other people uh, and look down on them for where they are in their walk. Uh, if I can't say amen this morning, I'll just give a ouch. Amen. Uh, the truth of the matter is. Uh, this desire to be the best, to be on top, to be number one, while natural for those of us chasing after the Lord Jesus Christ and desiring to grow in his image. We've got to be careful uh, even then uh, as his disciples uh, uh, show us in Mark chapter nine. Uh, the word tells us uh, in Mark chapter nine, Jesus has been working in a mighty and an awesome way. Uh, Mark chapter nine records the transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, when Jesus took with him uh, Peter, James, and John, and they go up to a high mountain and Jesus is transfigured. He's changed in a different image and they see him as his clothes become a dazzling white. They saw this amazing image. Even as Jesus was transfigured, then Elijah and Moses representing the law and the prophets show up with him, reminding them and us that Jesus is the fulfillment of every prophecy and and he is the end of the law. Somebody ought to be glad this morning uh, uh, that he is the greatest, but I want to be the greatest, Pastor A. Uh, me too. Uh, he then, uh, uh, there we see uh, this in this text, uh, there was a boy that had a demonic spirit and uh, you'll see Jesus heal the boy in an amazing way. And by the time then um, we get to uh, uh, Jesus uh, asking his disciples what they were talking about as they were walking along the way, uh, Jesus inquires of them what the conversation uh, was about. Uh, and here we see uh, in verse number uh, uh, 33 and 34, uh, as they come into Capernaum from Galilee, that he was in the house when Jesus got them by themselves. Uh, when Jesus had them in a private moment, uh, he asked the disciples, what were you talking about what were you arguing about? Jesus recognized that there was some intensity uh, to the conversation, uh, much like we debate who the goat or the greatest of all time is uh, uh, when it comes to sports and business and in other arenas. Uh, but here, then, verse 34 does it for me. It says, But they were silent, uh, for on the way they had argued with one another 
who was the greatest. They are debating who as disciples of the greatest one of all, they were debating among themselves who was the best disciple, who was the baddest disciple, who was the best preacher, who was the best prophet, who was the best of the best, who really was close in, who was most like Jesus. They, like us sometimes, were demonstrating a level of arrogance rather than humility. The true of the matter is we've got to understand then the difference between pride and humility. Amen. A proud heart will focus on the failures of others. A humble heart is overwhelmed by their own spiritual need. A proud heart is critical and fault finding. A humble heart is compassionate and forgiving. A proud heart is independent and self-sufficient. A humble heart is dependent and recognizes their need for others. A proud heart, a proud heart wants to prove all the time that they're right. An humble heart heart is willing to yield the right to be right. In other words, an humble heart, even though he or she is right, is willing to concede uh, for the sake of peace, doesn't always have to be right. Uh, the proud heart claims their rights. Uh, the humble heart yields their rights. Uh, a proud heart desires to be served and to receive. Uh, an humble heart desires to serve and to give. Uh, the proud heart desires to be a success. Uh, the humble heart is motivated to be faithful and to help others become successful. The proud heart has a drive to be recognized, lifted up, called out, and appreciated. The humble heart carries a sense of unworthiness and would rather fade into the background. The proud heart thinks how lucky others are to have them around. The humble heart thinks how incredible it is that God would use them at all. The proud heart is wounded when others are recognized. The humble heart rejoices when others are lifted up. The proud heart is sad and remorseful over their sin. The humble heart is genuinely repentant, desiring to forsake or turn away from sin. The proud heart is confident in how much they know. The humble heart is humbled by how much they have yet to learn. Lord have mercy. The proud heart is self-conscious. Ah, the humble heart is not concerned with his or herself. The proud heart privately keeps up others at arm's length. The humble heart is willing to risk getting close to others. The proud heart is quick to blame somebody else. The humble heart, Lord have mercy, accepts responsibility and sees where they could be wrong. The proud heart has a hard time saying, I was wrong or I'm sorry. The humble heart is quick to admit their fault and failure and to beg forgiveness. Men and women, uh, it is only the humble person who is great. I desire uh, to be great. Uh, great not in the sense of having a, a sports commentator name me on national television. Uh, great not in the sense uh, of winning multiple awards, uh, but is anybody in the sanctuary this morning uh, that desires to be great as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that desires to be great in your faith and in your faithfulness to the one who created you. Here then in Mark chapter nine, God proves is all true. Showing Christ as God in his transfiguration. A visit that shows up from eternal friends, Moses and Elijah, then by verbally commending his son from the glory cloud. After coming down the mountain with his three disciple friends, Jesus arrives to find the other nine disciples failing to depend on him through prayer, resulting in their inability to cast out a demon from a little boy. The Lord calls the boy's father to believe and delivers his only son while reminding his men of their great need to depend on him in faith. What happens next? is shocking at best. The disciples on the way have a debate about which of them is the greatest. It's important to understand the whole of the text that even as they're having a conversation about who's the greatest, they had just failed spiritually. 
they had been given an opportunity to minister to a young boy who was desperately in need and they could not uh, do what was necessary. They couldn't perform the miracle. Why? Uh, because they, in their uh, fullness of themselves, were trying to operate without Christ. Amen. Um, don't you and I know a little bit of something like that? Well, never mind. Let me speak for myself. Uh, every single time I thought that I could do it myself. Uh, amen. You know, we live in a DIY culture. Do it yourself. Uh, there is a kit for everything. Uh, there is a YouTube video for just about everything. Some of us have discovered that we know how to change, amen, faucets. Uh, some of us know how to install a new garbage disposal, uh, things that we normally would have called somebody else that we would consider a professional. YouTube has created a whole army of DIYers. If that's you, uh, amen, just look straight ahead, amen, uh, in the name of Jesus. And yet, uh, we, like the disciples, have to remember that there are some things that we can not see as a DIY project, amen, a, a do-it-yourself project that the disciples could not because they were not relying on Jesus. They were operating in their own strength, in their own gifts, in their own knowledge. They could not perform the miracle that they were being called on as Jesus was away on the mountain. It's interesting to me that even as they are moving, that they are arguing about who is the greatest. It makes you wonder what true greatness is. Is true greatness other people recognizing and affirming and celebrating? Is true greatness a name on a plaque? Is true greatness position? Is true greatness the ability to move in whatever direction you want to and to have people bend to your will? Is that then true way? It is for the glory of God. One commentator wrote this, pride is the worst sin. There is no other matter in which the heart can be more deceitful. Pride is God's most stubborn enemy. There is no sin so much like the devil as pride. Uh, this is huge, amen. This particular pericope, this part of scripture is a big piece of scripture. It's short, but it has a big, a big implication for all of us. Uh, these three disciples had just witnessed the glorious transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, they had then um, seen him heal a demon-possessed boy that nobody else could heal. Uh, in in spite of the amazing glory and power of God that was on display, you can't help but wonder what the disciples were thinking as they were traveling along the way. Notice that they were not talking about the transfiguration of Jesus. They were not talking about the transformation in the boy who had been demon possessed, but rather they were talking about essentially the transfer of power. They were talking about themselves. Isn't that just like us sometimes? <coughs> Excuse me. For God to move in awesome and mighty ways, for God to perform wonders, uh, for him to do exactly what we ask him to do. And instead of us talking about him, instead of us lifting him up, instead of us exalting him, instead of us glorifying him, we find ways uh, to make ourselves the hero of the story. We find our ways to make ourselves the focus, or worse yet, we act as if God hasn't done a thing. This morning, I want to be great. There are three things then that this text suggests to me in my desire to be great. And I want to share with you, even as the Spirit has given to me, that even as Christ is preparing for his crucifixion, the disciples are picking out their crowns. Come on, somebody. Anybody know no cross, no crown? Anybody understand that before I can be crowned, before I can receive a diadem, before I get a new robe, uh, Sister Reverend Mosley, that is white, before I get some new shouting shoes, before I get a new name written on a white stone that nobody else knows, before my crown 
crown. I've got a cross. Ah, Jesus said that I've got to take up my cross. Not every once in a while. Not when I feel like it. Not when it's convenient. But he said, take up your cross daily and follow me. That I've got a cross. You got a cross. All God's children got a cross. Ah, when I get to heaven, I'm going to lay down my cross. Then I'm going to shout all over God's heaven. But until then, the question was asked by the hymn writer, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. A part of then this text reminds us in order for me to be great, I got to be connected to the one who is the very essence of greatness. I've got to have a connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an ultimate demonstration of humility. Here then, one of the things about this text that really does me in is that Jesus coming off of the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus coming out of performing the one of the most amazing miracles, verse 30 says that he didn't want anybody to know it. Let's be honest, beloved. We oftentimes want folk to know everything we're doing. Social media for me is a, a one of uh, exhibit A. There are folk, amen, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, who can't eat breakfast without somebody knowing what they have for breakfast. God knows if they do something for somebody else, the first thing they want to do is take a selfie with the person that they blessed and make everybody else know that they bless somebody. Uh, no, the ultimate demonstration of humility uh, is that I don't have to be recognized. Uh, I'm okay if my name isn't called. Uh, I'm not going to have a tight jaw if my name is spelled wrong in the program. Uh, anybody know it doesn't matter if my name is in the program at all? Uh, why? Because there is uh, uh, a book uh, and another book where my name appears. Uh, uh, my, uh, my forefathers and foremothers sang it this way. They said, sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Uh, write my name on the roll uh, as long as I've been signed up. Uh, and as long as my name is on the roll, it doesn't matter whether you call my name. Uh, you don't have to spell it right. You don't even have to print it in the program. Why? Because we don't have to have everything we do known, amen, by everybody. Here then in the text, the word tells us that not only did Jesus demonstrate humility by not wanting, as he went through Galilee, anybody to know what he had done or that he was there. Because the Bible says, for he was teaching, verse 31, his disciples. Not only do I always not need recognition, amen, but in order to be great, I've got to be on purpose. I've got to walk in purpose and be intentional about my purpose. In this text, Jesus isn't there for the crowds. Jesus is not there for the celebration. Jesus right here in the text, at this very moment, his purpose is to teach his disciples. The truth is sometimes when I realize that I want to be great, I have to check myself because oftentimes what society and what the church even will say is great is that which attracts the most attention, that which is the most public. But the truth of the matter is Jesus is reminding us that oftentimes some of the greatest things that you can do in his kingdom don't draw a crowd. A lot of the things that you do that are great for his glory don't aren't even known by a whole lot of people or they don't get a whole lot of celebration or notice. Can I get a witness? There are some great things. God has used you to his honor and his glory and almost nobody knows about it. And uh, the proud heart is upset about that and needs to send selfies and text messages and emails and needs to post to social media. The humble heart is grateful that God would use them, amen, to his honor and his glory. Jesus then not only doesn't need recognition, but Jesus is also 
uh, resting in his purpose here. He is using the time to teach his disciples. He's talking to them about what's about to happen as he predicts his death and resurrection. But verse 32 says that, but they did not understand what he was saying and they were afraid to ask him. Beloved, isn't it interesting that we want to be great? And one of the signs, uh, amen, uh, oftentimes that uh, society ascribes to greatness is knowing and knowledge, amen. Um, isn't it something that when we don't know something, um, we are so full of ourselves, amen, that we don't want to admit we don't know something. The disciples then didn't know what Jesus was talking about. And the word says they were afraid to ask him. Uh, we're talking about being great. Uh, I want to share with you, if you want to be great, uh, learn how to ask questions, beloved. Learn how to ask even that which you don't know. Learn how to admit that you don't know something uh, and then be open to learning. Amen. Uh, nobody knows it all except for him. Amen. Uh, you've got to be then a lifetime learner. Here the disciples in verse 32, uh, the word says they were afraid to ask him. Him. But then verse 33 tells us that instead of seeking knowledge from the source, that is Jesus, they lapse into an argument about who is the greatest. Uh, they decide that they're going to debate something, uh, uh, Brother John Mosley, that they did know about, uh, that they're going to debate each other about which of them is the greatest disciple. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but I find myself uh, in this text recognizing uh, that God is calling for us to be humble in our hearts. He's seeking those who will walk in humility, not put on humility, not the kind of, oh no, y'all, I'm just, I'm, it's just me and I don't really, but really what we want is to be exalted and congratulated and lifted up. No, God then is talking to the church even as Christ had to speak to his disciples. And he said, there are just a couple of things that you've got to understand. And uh, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to expose those places uh, where you are not yet humble. Uh, uh, that's what verses 33 and 34 are about as they're coming to Capernaum. Christ exposes uh, uh, them uh, when he asks the question and nobody wants to tell the truth uh, about what they were really talking about. Uh, amen. The word says they were silent because of what they had been arguing about. Uh, every once in a while, God will expose the motives of our heart. Amen. Every once in a while, God will take a spiritual mirror and show me me. Anybody ever had that experience where you thought you had it together, where you thought you were doing the Lord's work, you thought you were moving in the right direction, and the Lord threw up a spiritual mirror, and what you saw in the mirror made you realize that you still have work to do, that you're not quite where you want to be, and maybe not where other people who are looking and listening listening to you think that you are spiritually. If you can't say amen, I got a great big ouch right here. Amen. Ouch. Uh, that Christ revealed uh, the disciples to themselves. He revealed that their hearts were not yet humble. Uh, Christ really challenged them and us. Uh, today, I want to be great. Uh, I don't want to be great in mankind's eyes uh, uh, because man doesn't have a heaven or a hell to put me in. I realize I want to be great in God's eyes. I want to please the Lord Jesus Christ. How then do I make the biggest impact? How do I do that? By humbling my heart, by growing in humility, by obeying what Christ said in verse number 35. The word says that in he sat down and he called the 12 to him. He had an intimate conversation with his disciples. Beloved, God wants to have through Christ Jesus an intimate conversation with you and with me as his disciples. He wants us to spend some time with him so he can teach us. He sat down and he called the 12 and he said, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. This is contrary to the way the world works. We live in a me first world and he's saying me last in order to be great in God's eyes that I've got to be last. Uh, amen. Uh, I don't know about you. I never, Brother Cameron, uh, like to come in last in anything. Uh, my husband said that I am a super competitive person.
person. Uh, that's true. Amen. Uh, and so this text challenges me uh, when Christ then says, uh, if you want to be first, if you want to be the greatest, uh, you got to first learn how to be last. Uh, anybody learning still how to be last this morning? Uh, learning how to subjugate your will to the will of God. Uh, how then uh, am I last uh, and still able to be first? Uh, Christ gives us the answer uh, as he speaks to his disciples. Uh, he said, first of all, uh, you've got to be first in your service. Uh, uh, it, uh, you're known for being a servant of uh, not doing your chores or taking out the trash. I'm not talking about that. That's all nice. Uh, Jesus isn't talking about uh, filling uh, your mom or your dad or your spouse or your significant other's tank uh, with gas. And that's nice. Uh, uh, but we're talking about uh, uh, with everybody and in all times and in all places looking for opportunities to serve. Uh, I, I don't know about you, uh, uh, but it's developing a sense of me last in a me first world. It's a sense that in, as Jesus says, as he's hanging out in this house, uh, he takes a child uh, and then he says to the disciples, uh, whoever welcomes somebody like a child in my name, you welcome me, uh, that I've got to be humble enough uh, then to receive anybody up. Uh, Think about it. Uh, I will anywhere, anytime talk to anybody's baby, anybody's child. Uh, it doesn't matter in the mall, in the grocery store, uh, how quick we are uh, to speak to a child, how quick we are uh, to encourage a child, uh, how quick we are to tell a child uh, you can do anything. Uh, but then I have uh, the conviction of the Holy Spirit uh, in this text that says, uh, yes, but how do you treat uh, uh, somebody who is fully grown, uh, who is sleeping? on the street. How do you treat that woman who looks like she just came out of a bar? How do you treat somebody who doesn't speak the same language as you? Do you treat them the same way you would treat a child? Jesus then, in talking to his disciples about humility, uses a child, the very essence and image of humility. Children who don't know something, don't mind asking you, not one or two questions, but take a child. Think about yourself as a child. Were you one of those children that had 5,000 questions every day? Were you one of those kids who had a question when you woke up in the morning and by the time it was time to go to bed, you were still asking questions? I'm thankful that Jesus in teaching about humility and how to be great would use the image of a child, a one who doesn't know what they don't know, and one who isn't so arrogant uh, that they refuse to ask, uh, that they refuse to inquire. Uh, I wonder if anybody this morning uh, uh, can recognize uh, that there are many things uh, that we do not know, uh, many questions uh, that we ourselves cannot answer. Uh, I, I can read all the books I want to, uh, uh, Brother Clyde Williams, uh, but there's some mysteries, uh, there's some secrets, uh, there's some answers uh, that will only come uh, uh, through my relationship with him, uh, there's some things uh, that I've got to have uh, a connection that is strong enough, uh, and then I've got to have a heart that is humble enough uh, for me to ask of the Lord. Uh, I've got to be humble enough then uh, to recognize uh, who I really am, uh, that I am not, as Muhammad Ali announced, the greatest boxer. Uh, I am not uh, the greatest basketball player. Uh, I am not the greatest tennis player. Uh, I'm not the greatest businesswoman. I would argue I'm not the greatest pastor and I'm not the greatest preacher, but I'm working on becoming the greatest servant, the servant that the Lord can use in order for me to have God move in my life, in order for you to have him move in your life. Beloved, humility is a requirement. It is not optional. Those of us in graduate school, those of us in college, we had courses that were called elective. I want somebody to know today that humility is not an elective in the life course of discipleship. Rather, humility is a mandatory course, and it's not a one-and-done course like statistics. It's not a one-and-done course like your language requirement, but rather humility has at every level of your spiritual growth, there is a humility course that you and I must pass. 
Jesus, I then find myself hearing the Apostle Paul talk about himself in 1 Corinthians 15 and 9, he reflected this principle of humility when he said, I'm the least of the apostles. I heard Cameron say a couple of weeks ago, I'm the least of the singers, but the Lord gave me a song and I sang it to the best of my ability. I think that is a wonderful example of humility. Paul said again in Ephesians 3 and 8, I am the very least of all the saints. Then he said, uh, in 1 Timothy 1 and 15, I am foremost, I'm the greatest of all the sinners. I wonder this morning if there's anybody in the virtual uh, sanctuary willing to say, I'm not the greatest saint, I'm not the greatest singer, I'm not even the greatest servant, but I'm working. I have a desire to be great for God, and not great as the world sees me, but I'm chasing greatness in the Lord eyes. Jesus said, anybody who wants to be great, you have to then be prepared to be last. That is last in recognition, last in being celebrated last in being served, last in being lifted up, last in being congratulated, last in having your name called out, last. I wonder this morning, who wants to be great? I understand Jesus lived this principle himself. He, the firstborn of the dead, he, the son of God, he, the son of David, he, heaven's pet child, he then counted himself last for you and for me. This idea of humility is a challenging one, but it is a requirement for those of us who would consider ourselves great. For those of us who would consider ourselves children of the most high God, humility then becomes one of our greatest challenges. The quote that I shared earlier, I believe the author is right. One of the greatest challenges for you and for me is to live a life of humility, to maintain a spirit of humility. The word tells us that pride comes certainly before a fall, and yet the world we live in is a prideful one. It's a world that promotes pride, that encourages pride, focus on self, the ability to shift your mindset to flip that thing where the